Welcome to the China Desk Podcast, presented by the Federal Newswire, with your host Steve Yates. Welcome to the China Desk Podcast, Episode 14. I'm your host Steve Yates, Senior Fellow at the America First Policy Institute and Chair of the China Policy Initiative. A reminder to our audience for whom we are most grateful. Uh, the subscribers can hear our interviews at Apple, Google, Spotify, and most other podcast providers.、Uh, they can also su- subscribe on YouTube. They can always hear all of our episodes at thefederalnewswire.com. My guest today is Robert Daly. Robert is director of the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. He previously served as U.S. diplomat in Beijing as an interpreter for Chinese and U.S. leaders. That included President Carter and Secretary of State Kissinger. He headed China programs at Johns Hopkins, Syracuse, and the University of Maryland.、Uh, worked as a producer of Chinese language versions of Sesame Street,、uh, a program I have a personal affinity for. I'll share a story in a second. Uh, and testified before Congress on U.S.-China relations.、But、Robert, welcome to the China Desk. Let's jump in. I'll get the Sesame Street thing out of the way at the at the outset as we talk a little bit about、uh, who you are and what your journey has been to bring you with us today to talk about U.S.-China relations and U.S.-China policy.、Uh, but my granddad was a country doctor. Uh, and his neighbor was also a doctor, although my granddad wouldn't allow us to call him that because he happened to be a professor at the University of Maryland,、uh, and so a professor in his mind was not a real doctor. But this professor at the University of Maryland, a professor of TV radio、uh, technologies at the time, had a student named Jim Henson. And、uh, we used to ta- tease Granddaddy about. You say he's not a real doctor, but you know, by way of Jim Henson, he kind of influenced a lot more lives than country doctor did. So,、uh, you know, going full circle on the personal, and we have a University of Maryland connection in common.、Yeah. Uh, but uh, Robert, why don't you share with us? Did you just wake up speaking Chinese and being ready to be an interpreter, or、uh, was it some part of your your college journey that brought you into this space? It actually had nothing at all to do with college. My background is、yeah. mostly in culture. I went to art school, painting, illustration. Uh, and American literature. I studied short story writing with Ray Carver and Toby Wolf at Syracuse. No history, no political science, no IR theory.、Uh, but like a lot of people who studied the things that I did, I was borderline unemployable after I graduated. <laughs> and I happened to take the Foreign Service exam, and the Foreign Service said, "You are henceforth interested in China." So, without any of that background, at 23, I joined the Foreign Service. Was very, very lucky. At the period in which I joined, and I had two full years of Chinese, and was just thrown into the midst of it, before and after Tiananmen Square, I was in what was then called the United States Information Agency. It's now called the Public Diplomacy Cone、uh, within the State Department, and we were responsible for all media, education, cultural, sports exchanges. We were basically involved.、Uh, the Chinese accused us of having a policy of peaceful evolution. And that was essentially correct, you know, and, and it in many ways remains correct. That that's I think a perfectly benign term, but really none of the formal training、uh, or the childhood stories about falling in love with Chinese characters,、uh, none of that.、Uh, so it was really just serendipity, and that you know luck has been a major theme throughout my career related to China. <laughs> well, we might have that in common too. Although your luck might have been better than mine, but、uh, I, you know, I can I can share with the audience.、Uh, most of the people know that I I speak Mandarin. Some of our guests don't speak any of it. We're brought on for subject matter expertise. But Robert and I have done some programs together、uh, in Mandarin, and I can I can give the imprimatur to the extent that this helps or hurts you, Robert. That actually is an outstanding speaker of Mandarin. Uh, and I don't say that about a lot of people.、Uh, so it's a it's a pleasure to have you on and talk a little bit about、uh, the issues that we have on the docket for today.、Uh, but in the pre-show, we were touching on、uh, an issue that I think is really really interesting, but also important. Uh, you mentioned sort of the time horizon when you were entering into the foreign service and entering into the U.S.-China debates or the, the work of U.S.-China relations. And before and after Tiananmen Square, I, I was a missionary in Taiwan before, during, and after Tiananmen too.、Uh, and it was just a different world.、Yeah. Uh, and D.C. was different too. 
Uh, there were different coalitions of people in Congress. Uh, you would have people in Congress, uh, Republican and Democrat, who might actually put their fellow party members' feet to the fire when they were in the executive branch, uh, whether it was a Tom Lantos uh, being uh, tough on human rights issues for uh, a Clinton administration or before, uh, whether it was a Henry Hyde who was on the Republican side who would stand up for a few different reasons, a few different policy issues uh, in uh, with Republican administrations. But we have uh, uh, in our discourse in think tank world or even the media, kind of some assumptions about Republicans are this, Democrats are that, conservatives are this, liberals are that. And China policy has kind of gone in a in an interesting and differing way. And of course, there's a third party in that in China that has a say in uh, what we're seeing and thinking. But if I framed that correctly, uh, share with us a little of your thoughts about what's been changing uh, and what are some of the upsides, but also frustrations you've run into in uh, talking about U.S.-China relations in these, these new circumstances? So I'll give you a very specific example. I was in the Foreign Service under Ronald Reagan and uh, George H.W. Bush, and I had uh, the great privilege of working with Ambassador Jim Lilly for two years yep. after 1989, and he and I stayed uh, in close touch thereafter. And I would see him at his office at the University of Maryland. He spent uh, some time there at the Maryland China Initiative. And this was when the debates about China's most favored na nation status or permanent normal trading relations and then WTO accession were coming up. And Lilly was a guy, he had a sort of a vinegar Joe Stilwell approach. You know, he, he, and he was somebody who could speak with tremendous credibility uh, to both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, was very comfortable getting in the door, even among some of the more hardline uh, Republican in those rooms, because he was perfectly ha happy to say, you know, these commie bastards. He was very comfortable with that. But he was also fantastically knowledgeable and pro-America, but not anti-China. And he was able, as I say, to speak with equal credibility and influence across the aisles. I don't see many Jim Lilly's out there today, even though there is you know, pretty broad bipartisan agreement, not about every aspect or the focal points of you know, China competition, but really there's, there's a consensus that China's our, our greatest long-term geostrategic threat. And yet, you know, in, in Thinklandia, in Washington, I don't see many of the more uh, conservative uh, or more, you know, sort of liberal thinkers uh, speaking with each other. They're not invited to each other's conferences most of the time. And I think that that probably hurts our policy formulation. And I suspect that when you strip away rhetoric, certain kinds of, you know, code vocabulary that, that, that both sides like to use and get down to real policy, we're not always that far apart. There's at least a very important conversation to be had, and, and it's often not being had. And this is one of the reasons I was you're very glad to get the invitation invitation to come on this program. Well, I couldn't agree more in terms of kind of the unique qualities of Jim Lilly. Uh, you know, among the many areas that gave him credibility is he actually lived and knew more about China than a lot of Chinese people did uh, because he was there before the revolution. Uh, his family had ties in missionary work and other experiences in, in China. So, I mean, he had really rock solid China bona fides. Uh, and he happened to be personal friends with a guy that ended up being president. Uh, that sort of ends up being uh, a unique form of credibility too. Right. And it was kind of before the world went crazy and sort of polarization and whatever else. And whatever anyone wants to think about those things, is, is def it's really hard to imagine there being another, another Jim Lilly anyway, just because he was cut from such unique cloth and from a, a really interesting point of history. Uh, but you're, you're right. I mean, I, I think we end up with a lot of conversations about uh, an administration. And if you are you know, a cheerleader for rah, rah, go team red or rah, rah, go team blue, uh, then your team can do no wrong and the critics are borderline evil. And how do you have a conversation with evil? And so that's, that has been, I, I think, toxic. Uh, and we lived through the 1990s when there was some pretty 
uh, strong debates about religious freedom or persecution, uh, the debates about tra trade and China's trade status. There, there were a lot of things swirling in that mix. Uh, the missile tests of 1995 and 96, I remember testifying alongside Jim Lilly. Mm. We were able to have uh, like a Garrett Gong and a Jim Lilly and even a crazy Steve Yates at a witness table and talk uh, talk about things uh, with then Senators Joe Biden and, J and John Kerry and a few other casts of characters at the time. But yeah, so I have I, I identify with the uh, the the observation that we're, we're in a very different place in this conversation. And yet. I, I agree with you that on uh, some key policy matters, uh, I'd like to ask your view. Uh, I mean, the whole approach and understanding of trade and supply chains, uh, quality control on the Chinese end and the implications of that for global markets. Uh, these are things that we talked about in the 1990s and the 2000s around those debates. Uh, but they're magnified much, much more in their strategic significance and global scope at this point. But when you just when you just look at trade, uh, where do you see uh, kind of whether it's think think tank land or Washington or just policymaking talking about China? Where do you see the shifts and where do you see the consensus? Well, I think we're still in the midst of a fairly long transitional period and we haven't yet figured it out. And so you hear uh, large inconsistencies in some of the things that we say about the trading relationship and its relation to our uh, security concerns. It's going to take a while to, 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 to figure this out. I do think uh, that Congressman Mike Gallagher uh, and his select committee, this is, he, he himself has said, this is going to be the focal point. They're going to get around to this. You know, they're talking some about TikTok and some about Confucius Institutes. But what we really haven't taken on is this question. And we've been saying for a while, um, and it goes beyond an industry by industry analysis, we're in this position where we're saying any, you know, we, America, our power is built in part on having the world's greatest companies and having, or having a lot of the world's greatest companies. Number two is you can't be the world's greatest company if you're not dealing somehow with the world's largest market. But insofar as you succeed in China, you are in some way, either directly or indirectly, building up what China calls its comprehensive national power. And we now understand that power to be in serious and ongoing opposition to our own. This is what has changed. We used to trade with China because of a uh, desire for profit, uh, because of human flourishing, you know, improving the, the well-being of one-sixth of humankind. That, that's no small thing. And to some degree, to get China integrated, it was about human flourishing. But now we understand China's economic and technological power, its development, I think, I think properly, as instrumental to China's power. That, that's, that's really the fundamental shift. But our companies are still very involved. So how do we handle that? Do we pull all of them out? And we don't know the answer to this. Uh, we've been highly selective uh, we're trying to protect our profits, but our statements about our security issue, you know, problems vis-a-vis -vis China are fairly absolutist. Followed through to their logical conclusion, they do lead to something like a complete decoupling, which no one quite wants, and it's not clear that that even makes sense and works out for us in the long term. So these are issues that are rooted in our economic system, in our history, uh, and they're not going to change in a year or two. I see a lot of confusion on both sides. Uh, just sort of one quick example, if I could. Um, the select committee to date is looking when it, uh, primarily at Hollywood, uh, tech to some degree, and universities. And there are issues that we could talk about in, in concerning issues in all of those areas. But it sounds, from where I sit, also a little bit political because these are also the sectors that a lot of Republicans think are irredeemably woke anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that that sounds a little bit suspicious, but we tend to be very pro agricultural sales to China, for example. Well, you know, anyone we can play at this game, an army travels on its belly. How do we know that American proteins are not going into the PLA or the security apparatus or the Communist Party? I mean, you see what I'm getting at. There's any successful business with China can be seen as contributing to comprehensive national power almost all of which we regard as problematic. And I think that that's essentially a correct view. Uh, 
we don't know how to reconcile it in either party. Mm -hmm. And this is going to take a long time. Well, it took a long time to get where we are. Uh, and China 30, 40 years ago uh, was not in this position of being the manufacturing right. platform for the world. We didn't have overwhelming dependency upon their pro providing us our pharmaceuticals. Uh, and we had a, a whole host of dependency relationships that in many ways we built. Right. Uh, and the multiple trillions of US and other people's dollars going into China certainly did at least as much, if not more, to uh, fuel the rise of China than any policy decision made by Beijing. Uh, but uh, how, what's your take on how things have changed inside China? Surely you have people uh, who are friends that are in China or knowledgeable and ob observe things from the inside too. Uh, you know, we tend in D.C. and in the American media to look at things first and foremost through an American lens. Uh, that's fine. It's legitimate in its own way. Uh, but as I was intimating in our other part of the conversation, uh, there is an actor in this conversation that's independent of what the American left and right thinks and is talking about. And it's changed inside China. Right. Uh, I would posit as a thesis that Xi Jinping is a very different kind of Chinese leader than those that uh, I'd observed and worked with American leaders interacting uh, with some of the Chinese leadership. Didn't mean I thought those other ones were angels, but I just think the tenure of Xi Jinping is very, very different. But it, it, what's your take? Is it that Xi Jinping is different or today's China and today's Communist Party leadership, not just Xi Jinping, is in a different position? Well, uh, I largely agree with the analysis that you just provided. Uh, there was been a critique over the past several years that says, you know, engagement failed. Not only did engagement fail, but it was always a sucker's game. We, we, we should mm -hmm. have known better right along. We got taken. Actually, I, I disagree with that view. I would say that engagement was working gradually and unsatisfactorily, but consistently up until and there's an argument about this, was it up until the Beijing Olympics? Is it up until the advent of Xi Jinping? Uh, but China was, in fact, becoming more integrated, more open. And while there were always tremendous human rights problems and the Communist Party was always in control, even from the point of view of personal freedom, seen broadly, uh, China was improving during much of the period uh, between 1979. And I, I tend to put it uh, at you know, Xi Jinping's arrival in, in late 2012, but you can, you, you can argue that. And then China, uh, under Xi Jinping, has gone from an author being an authoritarian developmental state to being a techno-totalitarian and profoundly ideological state, uh, to being, as is often said, uh, more repressive at home and more aggressive abroad. This, I think, can't be argued. It's, it's very clearly the case. Now, is that Xi Jinping or is that China under anybody feeling its oats? That mm -hmm. one gets a little tougher to answer and it gets into civilizational and cultural questions that we may not have you know, time for now. What I would say uh, is that China has politics just as we have politics. And if I look back at our, at our last four presidents, you know, at, at Biden and Trump and Obama and Bush, four very different men, but I would argue each of them in their own way American to the core, none of them un-American, but representing different major strands that make up the American braid. And there's something of the kind, obviously not in, in, in the absence of political pluralism, that exists in China. There are different major braids in modern China. And the nationalist, aggrieved, aggressive, expansive one that she, recommend, she represents was always there. But there's also a far more liberal outward looking, uh, open integrationist China uh, that we have seen and which I think is still there, although it's, it's really gone to ground in the public sphere, uh, but it's still there. And so you asked about Chinese views and the views of you know, Chinese intellectuals and Chinese economists in particular, when they can speak freely, tend to be that it is more Xi Jinping, that there has really mm -hmm. been a change and that it was the move away from what China called reform and openness that is the big error. That has been compounded by other errors, most notably in the views of many Chinese standing shoulder to shoulder with Vladimir Putin. Uh, but it is clearly, a lot of this is Xi Jinping. Uh, 
But we can't rest too easily on that. Uh, if she meets his demise tomorrow, China doesn't let Xinjiang or Tibet go free. China may still want to incorporate Taiwan. China is still a very large, powerful nation. So, yes, I agree with you that Xi Jinping marks the moment of change. I don't think we quite we don't know, we don't know everything we need to know to analyze what is Shiist and what is going to be typical of a wealthy, powerful China under any circumstances. Yeah. Uh, well, you bring back a lot of memories of of past uh, policy advocacy and analysis. Uh, in even the Deng Xiaoping era and the, the Jiang Zemin era, where we would have these uh, long conversations about reformers and hardliners, and we needed to engage in order to empower the reformers and continue this positive trend and don't give fuel to the hardliners who are the skeptics, presumably the soil from which the seed of Xi Jinping was planted and rooted and, and popped above the surface when the time came. So it's true that he didn't come as a bolt out of the blue. He was right. in the system and this was there, but it is profoundly different in uh, the last 70 years of U.S.-China relations uh, for there to be an openly belligerent tone uh, coming from uh, a number of different Chinese leaders uh, straight out of the foreign ministry uh, where that used to be kind of the broadcast booth for all is well and peaceful and cooperative in China, and all we want is peace and your money, uh, and to to something that's really kind of aggressive in a, in a different way. Uh, and also, uh, the aggression isn't just aimed at America. No, by bad no Uncle means. Sam. Uh, that that struck me as as a very different change. Under Xi Jinping, I mean, the the nationalist folk in China would always say tisk tisk to the overseas Chinese community wherever they were. Remember the motherland, but this seems to have been operationalized in ways that uh, are much more open and aggressive than I th I thought I had ever seen. Uh, whether it's the the police stations that pop up or kind of calls to uh, for for the overseas Chinese and Australians to remember your job in Australia is to make them have a pro-China policy when their job in Australians as citizens is to vote for the right Australian leaders. But uh, uh, so, I mean, do you have sort of the same perception of that trend or is there well, something it, that the I The trend missed? is continually developing. We had an interesting sounding on this recently when China's new ambassador, uh, Xie Fang, arrived. And the first thing he did, it wasn't widely reported, but he published two open letters. One was to uh, Americans of Chinese extraction in the United States, and one was to Chinese students in the United States. And what was interesting about them, it was interesting first, that, that was the first thing he did. Uh, but, you know, China learns the message that Xi Jinping and that Li Keqiang had been delivering to diaspora Chinese was very much as you characterized it. Uh, once a Chinese, always a Chinese. You all have a contribute. You all have an obligation that you know uh, from your DNA to contribute to the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. And this, among other things, puts a great big target on the back of many patriotic Americans who don't deserve to have a target right. on their back. So the new letter from Xie Fang was much more benevolent. It mm. was in a a loving paternalistic, but inclusive way. There, 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 you didn't feel, you know, iron beneath the velvet glove. And so they're, they're learning. It's becoming a more attractive, inclusive, inviting message, the purpose of which remains absolutely the same. <laughs> uh, but they, they, they learn as a matter of style. Uh, so you saw you know, what came to be called wolf warriorism, which was a term I, I didn't exactly like. Um, oh, it's or, one of my favorites. Well, you know, but some <laughs> of them, you see some of these guys, there's older language, you know, yeah. Lu Chayet, the ambassador to France, and the things he says. And you know, on the one hand, it's it's wolf warriorism. On the other hand, I mean, maybe this guy's just an asshole, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, there's, there's a certain, it's hard to know uh, quite, quite what you're deal dealing with. And they, they think they're rolling that back now. They're, they're being a little bit less coarse, but they still open. And the new ambassador, Xie Fang, also opened with all friction in the, in the relationship is entirely the fault of the United States. Mm 
Yeah. And what must be done is that you have to, I guess, in sackcloth and ashes, stand on the right side of history. And of course, that's that's the death of any meaningful conversation. Uh, so, but yes, they are still looking at uh, members of the diaspora. They are still hoping to work through the diaspora. One of the things that we've learned over the past few years is how very, very difficult this is uh, because China does try to work through the diaspora. I think that our, our concerns about their goals and their methods are essential. Uh, and yet we've got to be really careful about racial profiling, right? Mm -hmm. How do you go at this without sounding as though you're accusing people before the fact? I think we're getting better on that. And I think, again, yeah. the select committee has done a pretty good job on this. They, they open with this, they acknowledge the difficulty, and then, then they move on. So maybe we're finding a way to have this conversation, but it's a tricky one. It is a tricky one, but it's a, one of these nifty little traps where uh, it's sort of a question of who was racist per first. Uh, the, you know, if the, if the Communist Party's united front is going to be out there profiling people by ethnicity, and then that opens legitimate counterintelligence or other undue influence questions, they've put that bullseye on someone. Uh, and they do it. They do it in other areas too, uh, whether it's uh, entertainment or uh, finance and corporate world or what have you. They're they're going in and they're more or less saying, you know, you you've got a sweet deal with us. You you better start. You better be our advocate on the inside. Right. Uh, that's not working things. for them so well anymore. That's, right. That's they're having right. real trouble with that. But yes, I mean that that's what I would love to see. Because a lot of the advocacy organizations um, for Asian Americans and Chinese Americans, I think, have, very, have done a very good job at pushing back against what has been some real concerning racial profiling and some of the you know, problems that we've had in this country. And they, they've been calling that out, and that's been very effective. They haven't done. And what I've been telling some of them that I wish they would do is call out Beijing as well. You know, yeah. they, they really need to say to Xi Jinping or Li Keqiang or now Xi Fang, uh, we're not your diaspora. We're Americans, yeah. and there, we have a wide range of views on these issues, as do all Americans and as do all Chinese. And cease and desist on this sort of proprietary patriarchal tone uh, and call them out, you know, with, with equal vigor. I think that's a that's been a missing piece. Again, I support the work against racial profiling and anti-Chinese, anti-American Racism. Um, I, th I think that has to be done. But there's this other piece, and I'm still waiting on it. Yeah, well, it's it's yeah, it's definitely one of those things that there's far less coverage of it. There's far less speaking out against it. Uh, and if you know to get out of this chicken and egg cycle of it, it it's got to be done, uh, or we just sort of stay where we are. Um, you know, you raised a couple of issues that. I think are uh, are worth pulling the thread on. Um, you know, you, you talked a little bit about this issue of people. You know, all the the tone or of this new scene setting uh, of the ambassador arriving in the United States, as all of the friction in the relationship comes from the U.S. side alone. Uh, some Americans might look at what the recent efforts by the Biden administration have been to cool the tensions or seek a reset in the relationship or whatever the verbiage is that they prefer. We've sent a national security advisor, a secretary of state, uh, and I think the, uh, the climate czar, John Kerry, is supposed to be on his way to talk right. about things uh, on the way toward having the president talk. We've had most recently the secretary of treasury, Yellen, uh, go. Uh, by some eyes, we'd see the proverbial bow, which we saw embodied in that in that exchange, but uh, some of that body language, uh, from an American point of view, uh, could be seen by some as implicitly not necessarily disagreeing that uh, from the American side we're trying to put these frictions to rest, and we're asking the Chinese if we do, will you? How how, how should we unpack? That? Well, first, I wouldn't I wouldn't read much, uh, you know, that sort of bow. My read on that. Um, and, and, and we're both men of a certain, I think, similar age and, and probably yeah. cultural experience. 
uh, is that comes from American misperceptions about Asia, which are largely derived from Japanese customs. Yep. You know, from having seen in the 70s and 80s, you know, in, in Japan, they do bow. And as you know, in, in China, they don't. And I think a lot of Americans don't make those distinctions very closely. Unfortunately. Think, no, but I really think this is what that is. Yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah. it just comes from this fairly simple place. It's not deference. It's, and I, because mm. I've seen it in China many times from many Americans who just sort of tend to incline, whether from the <laughs> shoulders to the waist. I, I really think it's that straightforward. It's the 1980s and they want their bow back. I think it's just that, you know, the Chinese never really, um, they're not great bowers. And as you know, they're, they're, they're quick to talk about <laughs> Japanese well, she did both. Bowers. She did the bow and the shaking of hands. Yeah, so but then this, I've seen this confusion <laughs> scores of times. There, there's still, yeah. you know, for all of us, putting aside all of politics, just coming back to culture, for most Americans, you say China, and they're sort of, their heads are wrapped in a purple mist. Orientalism, exoticism, mystery, and they default to these sort of, you know, lost horizon orientalist notions about Asia, and they bow. And I, I really think but that's all we're looking at here. Um, so I, I think we need to uh, cut her a break on that one, although it's true the Chinese don't bow. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't see the Biden administration as going for a reset. Uh, I think we're seeing two things, one of which um, for relevant conversations I know is going on, and the other of which uh, I'll offer an interpretation of, although it's something that the Biden administration wouldn't say. The first thing is that the Biden administration, I think, has done a very good job of outreach to allies and partners in other countries. Uh, and that, I think, has been very successful. It's not complete, uh, but it's been a constant effort of theirs vis-a-vis -vis China. And they really have onboarded the messages that they get uh, from close allies as well as to more distant partners and non-partners that other countries want to know that this relationship is being managed carefully and well, and that it's not improvised and that it's not ideological and that it's not going to draw us into a third world war. They've been hearing a lot of this. And so the series of discussions I see as the administration having found its sea legs, uh, no longer being as afraid of you know, political criticism from their opponents that you're soft on China. And, and, and this, a lot of this is about showing Europe in particular, but Asian partners as well as, well, as other countries, that in fact we're committed to managing this and not dragging the world into war. That's one piece. The second piece is my own view is that the, only, the, the framework that makes sense for this relationship that accounts for all of the facts most completely and most fruitfully is that we are, in fact, already engaged in a Cold War. Mm -hmm. I think that this, this, this is a Cold War. It's not the Cold War. It has many distinctive features, some of which are more worrisome, some of which are encouraging. But in fact, it's a Cold War. And it's going to be that long. It's going to be that dangerous, uh, that costly, that wasteful. Uh, you know, like you, I, I probably, a number of young people just starting to learn Chinese come to me all the time and say, you know, what, what's our career path? And I tell them, well, most of you are going to be cold warriors in one form or another. I think, I think that's where we are. Yeah. Uh, the Biden administration won't say it's a cold war. Uh, but I think that, th that their own language points in that direction. And of course, the goal of a cold war is to keep it cold. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a play for time such that we avoid war. And I think that this in trying to stabilize the relationship, you notice that when China and the United States say we need to stabilize the relationship, they never characterize the nature of the relationship that we're stabilizing. Very careful not to. And what this really means is that we want to be at a sort of post Cuban missile crisis area of constant discussion with China uh, precisely so that we maintain peace. But we're still going to be going at each other uh, with everything we've got. I don't see any sign that the threat percep perceptions of the Biden administration or its determination uh, have weakened in the least. So I think it's to show responsible management and it is to get to a point where we are actually managing, whether you call it a Cold War or not, a relationship in which we are trying to prevail uh, and even to do some harm to the other by all means short of war. And this is part of that. Well, there's two broad areas I'd like to make sure we get to before we get into our wind down. Uh, one is back to sort of some notions about the relationship uh, and the trade relationship in particular. I want to talk a little bit about uh, a principle of reciprocity. We've talked about it in uh, 
uh, U.S. trade policy for a long time. It had a bit of a revival during the tenure of Bob Lighthizer in the last administration. And there was there have been uh, murmurings of this on both sides of the political aisle for a long time. In fact, uh, Ambassador Lighthizer would say over the arc of his distinguished career, he had a lot of his time where he was meeting with Democrats in Congress on a lot of the same concerns about unbalanced trade or unfair pra- practices and things like that, uh, as uh, even more so than with Republicans. And then he ended up being an appointee in, in the Trump administration. So just this idea of uh, shouldn't this notion of reciprocity play a greater role in our thinking and decision making of what we uh, what we are allowed to do in China should be perhaps considered to be on the list of what they are allowed to do in the United States and what we're prohibited from doing in China, perhaps we should be looking at prohibiting them to, from doing in the United States. Uh, mm-hmm. I know from the engagement period from Deng and through the 90s, that was put aside for some other reasons. But do you think that this notion of reciprocity and moving back toward some sense of balance, using that as the conversation point, has more of a place in the conversation today? I think the way you just put it, you know, using it more, does it have a place in the conversation? I think that's the right way to regard it. I think it's an underused tool. The, the difficulty with reciprocity and a lot of other policy tools is it, it inherently makes sort of a moral claim, right? Because mm-hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a moral standard. It's not just a, it's not like a tariff. It's not a mechanical aspect of trade. And I remember after I joined the Foreign Service, um, George Kennan, in what may have been one of his last essays in foreign affairs, it was called... Uh, morality in foreign policy. And he said that if there is such a thing as morality in foreign policy, one of its hallmarks must be consistency. And this is where we get into difficulty, uh, because there are some place areas in which the relationship is not wholly reciprocal, but we want to do it anyway for because either we want the profits or we know somebody else would take them. There are places where we might want to invoke reciprocity vis-a-vis China but we don't wish to invoke reciprocity in those same sectors vis-a-vis allies, partners, places in other parts of the world. So I would I would use it as more regularly as a tool. I think it needs to be pointed out constantly when it's not reciprocal. But I think we need to be careful about having it as too prominent a banner because history indicates that it's impossible for us to be consistent about it, either in our relationship with China and certainly not in our relationships with all of all of the world. But we need to talk about it more often. And it's not just trade. If yeah. it were up to me, you know, if the Wall Street Journal or the, the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post is going to publish an op-ed by a Chinese ambassador, it should say right up front, because we value freedom of expression and want to have a full public debate and understand the views of other countries. We welcome this essay by the Chinese ambassador, but Ambassador Nick Burns, who, Ambassador whoever, would never be allowed to print an uncensored um, piece in the Renmin Bao. Anytime uh, a Chinese ambassador gives a speech, he should be asked right up front, could an American ambassador give a speech uh, to a group of this kind and have it reported on freely in China? Answer, no. How do you feel about that? Then we know they're going to say, well, it's actually, there is reciprocity because we act here according to American law and you have to act in China under Chinese law. And my five-year-old kids would see through that. So it's yes in trade, but it's, it's not just trade. Access and voice is another place to invoke it regularly because they don't have a good answer. You don't take away their voice, but you note this right up front. So I think that's a really important contribution to the conversation and certainly agree that the, the principle needs to be uh, thought about, applied, and put into the conversation well beyond just trade. I mean, there's there's even the notion of could American students have equal access to education opportunities inside China? Can can Americans have equal opportunity to employment opportunities inside China? Right. Uh, and so there's there's a whole host of things where this ought to be a part of the conversation. You bring up a, a creative and constructive way to do it uh, without cutting off the interactions that we might have a national or strategic interest in continuing. Um, the other broad uh, 
category that I want to make sure that we jump into. Uh, I, I believe the Wilson Center had a delegation that re- recently went to Taiwan. Yes. Uh, I allegedly saw some social media postings of the awesome leader of the Wilson Center of several sites in, uh, in Taipei. Uh, and of course, Taiwan has been in a much different and more intense a discourse in America and other parts of the world after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also coincident with former Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. There's just been a very different uh, profile and tone in the conversation about things Taiwan, whether is Taiwan next, uh, even just in the course of is does Xi Jinping feel like this is something I must and need address? Uh, but I'd love to draw out your observations and thoughts from having uh, had just had a delegation go over there. Uh, but also, you've been watching this policy discourse for a long time, been a participant in the conversations. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure seems to me something has changed. Uh, but what does it really mean? Uh, you know, and how should we assess uh, the the timing likelihood of various coercive actions from China? And what should Americans and American policymakers be putting as priorities to think about and do about it? Well, there's an encyclopedic book in the answer to that question, and it would end up uh, still being ambiguous and inconclusive and frustratingly so uh, at the tail end. Uh, I think that overall, the attention on Taiwan internationally does not work in Beijing's favor at all. Uh, This was a topic that a great many countries were uh, just very accustomed to not raising one way or the other. And now it's not just the Americans that raise this. It's, it's in most European countries. And I have a lot of them as well. Does How does China's analysis of what happens in Ukraine influence its, its decisions about Taiwan? And I say this doesn't work for China. We have an interesting case in Lithuania. You know, Vilnius, what, about a year ago, um, changed the name of what we would call Tecro, the Educational Cultural Relations Act, just simply to the Taiwan Representative Office. And China engaged in in a predictable round of economic coercion. And initially, the rest of Europe was a little bit miffed uh, at Lithuania for raising this and leaving it at all, because China was taking a page out of our book and saying that uh, Germany also couldn't export to China any uh, equipment that had Lithuanian-made parts. Lithuania, this has played out pretty well for them. Actually, yeah. you know, they've Lithuania, like South Korea in its way, Australia and Canada in theirs, have shown that even middle powers or small countries, if if they stand up, uh, can actually counter Chinese coercion and can flourish in some ways. I'm sort of taking this in a slightly different direction. But just to, to make the point that Europe is also focused and China hates that question, because, as you know, for Beijing, nothing is analogous to China. All analogies to China are on the face of them (laughs) illegitimate because China is sui generis. So this is just wrong at the outset. Uh, But in fact, the the, the focus, I think, harms Xi Jinping. Uh, We all know that he has asked the People's Liberation Army uh, to be fully ready by 2027 uh, to move on Taiwan under all contingencies. Uh, That is not a decision to do so. It's It's a decision to be ready. I am not among what seems to be a, a slight majority uh, in Washington that thinks that uh, a move might be imminent. I, I'm not of that view. I think that we can, through deterrence, and we've, we're strengthening deterrence considerably, through alliances, uh, through rhetoric and public diplomacy, uh, do what we've always done, which is kick the can. Uh, to have Xi Jinping wake up and say, my determination is undimmed, uh, but this is not the day, this is not the year, because the potential costs outweigh the benefits. I think that has to be the goal of policy. The morning we wake up and hear that they've moved, uh, even by a blockade, that's a bad morning. And so we, we, our goal is to have that morning not occur. Uh, and I think that especially with Xi Jinping, with the economic uh, problems that he's facing, and they're not just economic, it's exacerbated by a demographics crisis that's come about 10 years than they thought by a relative uh, diplomatic isolation, Xi Jinping's fault, you know, the debt crisis, the housing crisis, a secular slowdown. Uh, this is his real focus for, for now. And so I think that we are broadly on the right track uh, in raising uh, 
the profile of the issue and increasing Taiwan's ability to deter. Uh, I don't, but I think that we can also, through all means, including diplomacy, uh, have them keep on deciding that, that, that now is not the time. I think this, this is within our ken and our broad shifts, a little forward, a little back, uh, in this department over the past six, eight years, I think have been encouraging. Well, on that optimistic note, I want to thank you, Robert, for an expansive, enjoyable, and informative conversation. I think we veered into many different avenues that the, the average sit down on China doesn't often get to cover. Uh, so I want to want to thank you for that. Before we get into our wind down, uh, for the audience that wants to track your work, your observations on the news of the day, where do they find you? Where would you like to invite them to to follow your work? So I guess um, a few a few recent things. One one a little bit less recent. About a year ago, June third, uh, I was invited to give a talk, which is not a typical think tank talk. There's a group uh, on the Hill called Faith and Law. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and they called me up and asked if I would give a talk on U.S.-China relations from an explicitly Christian viewpoint. Uh, now, as you say, this doesn't happen in think tanks and the, and the Wilson yeah. Center is uh, federalized. I'm a Fed. Uh, but I did it. And so you can find that on the podcast on the Faith and Law website. It's a slightly different angle on all of this. And I say it was, it, it was an explicitly, they asked for an explicitly Christian viewpoint. And that's, that's what I gave them. It's still, it's still my viewpoint. It's just a different aspect of it than I often have. Um, also uh, coming out very, very soon, there is a new major report from the Hoover Institution on semiconductors, American security and Taiwan security uh, that Larry Diamond and Orville Schell, a few others led on. And it was a great mix of technologists uh, the political types, um, you know, Matt Pottinger was, has one of the chapters in it. Um, Mattis was, was, was involved. Uh, McMaster, I think, uh, penned some things there. Uh, Matt Turpin and I co-authored one of the chapters in that. This, of course, is a, it's a growing issue. It's dense. Uh, it's highly technological. But for those who are so inclined, uh, this is probably a good place to look. Awesome. Well, I want to encourage the audience to, to follow your work and continue the conversation. Uh, just say to our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. Uh, we encourage you to subscribe and share with your friends uh, and continue to uh, pull us down from your preferred podcast providers. Uh, I want to thank you for joining. Thank you Robert, to Robert Daly for his insights. Until next time, I'm Steve Yates, your host here at the China Desk. Thank you for listening to the China Desk podcast, presented by the Federal Newswire and hosted by Steve Yates. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream. 